Thank you, ladies. Scott, what a wonderful way to just invite the Spirit to be with us this morning as we begin worship together. I'm so glad to be with you and those that are connecting with us online. Good morning. If it is your first time here or one of your first times here, I'll just draw your attention to the Connect cards that are in those pews in front of you. Um, we had a great week of VBS, so I, I'm just saying that to say that you might pull one of these out. You might also pull out a piece of confetti and or a feather. But um, just know that we had a fantastic week together here, and I know so many people in this room and, um, and other places around the campus just were with us all week and helped with prep, and so thank you. What an incredible week it was. Um, it is so good to be together here today. So as we are worshiping, definitely fill that Connect card out. And if you have prayer requests as well, those are on the back of that. And you can turn this card into any member of our host team this morning. Um, and they'll get it to one of us so that we may pray with you or reach out and see what uh, any questions that you might have about following Jesus together at Foundry. Um, there are still lots of things going on in the life of the church, even with the week of VBS behind us. So let's take a look and see what it's happening. Howdy, Foundry family. Are you looking forward to the second best birthday in our country's time? Only second to Jesus, of course. It's America's birthday coming up, and we're going to help you celebrate it. We want you to purchase a brisket party pack for $125 in time for the famous America's birthday. All proceeds will go to support Kairos Prison Ministry. Kairos is a volunteer-led ministry to incarcerated individuals and their families. Kairos consists of three main programs through which we are able to share the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ in tangible ways. Buy a brisket party pack today and help restore life. Brisket Party Pack includes a fully smoked brisket, three eight-inch hot links, and one loaf of white bread. Make sure to go to foundrychurch.org slash brisket. We'll pick those briskets up on June 30th, so they'll be ready to enjoy on July 4th for America's birthday. Thank you. Do you have a favorite worship song or hymn that moves you? Throughout the entire month of July, we're highlighting our favorite worship songs and hymns in all of our worship venues, as well as on playlists on our website. That's right. During the month of June on Sunday mornings in worship, you'll have the opportunity to vote for your favorite worship song or hymn. And then during the month of July, we'll come back together and worship, compile those votes, and celebrate what moves us. Hi, ladies. Now that the school year is over, we are so excited about our women's summer Bible studies taking place at both campuses starting the week of June 19th. We'll be offering two different studies, praying circles around our children, which will be paired with Yoga Faith, and For His Glory. Child care will be provided at each campus, and you can find out all the details as well as register over on our website, foundrychurch.org women. We hope to see you this summer. Lots of good stuff. I don't think we've ever had the backslash brisket before. That made me chuckle. Like it's like missions, music, brisket. Um, but it's great. Definitely go check those out. If you'd like to vote on your favorite hymn and you didn't pick up one of these cards, they're available in the Narthex today. Or there's a QR code that you can uh, that you can scan. I'm loving reading what some of y'all's favorite hymns are. Some of you are just telling me your favorite song, and that's exciting too. But Fleetwood Mac is not in the hymnal, and so likely we will not be singing any of that in the month of July. <laughs> Um, but we are, uh, as we turn to continue to worship together, would you stand with me and let us, let us call each other together with these words from Proverbs 3. Let his love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind these things around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Lord, lead us to trust in you with all our heart, and lead not on our own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him. Lord, lead us and make our paths straight. Heavenly Father, God, this is our plea that you would indeed lead us this morning in this place. We are so grateful for this place, Lord, where you dwell, where your spirit comes in and, and fills it. 
We are so grateful that this is not just a place where we may sing and pray and listen together, but this is a pr- place where, where families can be, where children can be, that this is a place where the broken can come to your altar, Lord, and feel your presence. God, lead us in your spirit this morning, that in all things and every word and every note and every movement, we may hear your voice. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. And in Jesus' mighty name, we continue to worship together. Join me as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
seated. Hey, Foundry family, what an exciting week as hundreds of kids came onto our campus for Vacation Bible School. It's one of the biggest weeks of the year, and it was such an awesome celebration. I want to share just a little bit of that with you. As you can see, it was a great week filled with fun and with all of our kids learning more about Jesus and, and being able to hear the message of the good news that God loves them and God has a plan for their life and that they can have a relationship with him through Jesus. And so thank you for contributing to the work of Foundry so that we can share the message of Jesus with more and more people of all ages. As we do each week, we highlight giving because giving is so critical to our mission of helping people know, follow, and share Jesus. You can give and make a difference in this way in many ways. You can give by text, online, or by mail, or if you're in person, there are boxes at the exits. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the seeds that were sown this week. I thank you for uh, all of the children who came into our midst and came in onto our campus and heard the message of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that your word would take root that these young disciples would learn to follow you and fall more in love with you. I thank you for all of those who served and made a difference, made an impact by giving of their time and their energy. I know, Lord, it is hard work and they are tired at the end of this week, but it is well worth it. And I thank you for their effort. And I thank you, Lord, that they made a difference leading kids to know, follow, and share Jesus. I pray, Lord, that as we give back, that you would Increase our joy in giving, knowing that we are truly making a difference, that you would take this offering, that you would multiply it, that you would use it to bring more and more people to know Jesus, to follow him with their lives. Let us, Lord, share you like a city on a hill, be a light in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
and for our scripture reading this morning from Mark 1, verses 40 through 45. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer your cleansing, what Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, as we continue to worship, we know, Lord, that it is indeed your love that has led us to this place. Your love that celebrates with us, God, when we have great joy. Your love that comforts us when our sorrow is deep. Your love that seeks out each one of us in our brokenness and offers forgiveness, healing, peace. Lord, as we continue to worship in your name, as we continue to hear what it is that you would speak to us today. I I pray that your blessing, that your word and that your spirit would fall on this room, would fill each ear, each heart, and each mind. That, Lord, you would not just speak to us, but you would move within us. Would you move within Luis this morning? Would you let your presence be so full in him, God, that it is not a word of his own, but yours only that he speaks? And for us as we listen, would you clear away distraction? Would you calm those things that might be causing us worry or anxiety? And Lord, let your love and your word just take over in a mighty way. Lord, we pray these things as a family of faith given to one another in your spirit, in your mercy and your power. Let us pray together the way that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. morning. As we get started, I just want to say a word of thank you to our staff and to our volunteers and those of you who brought your children and your grandchildren to VBS. It was truly a a group effort to pull something of that magnitude off. In one of the closing ceremonies, I was asked last second to come in in here and I asked Kelly to help me and we ripped the pillow open right in here and it looked like it snowed. Uh, of of feathers, and I had no idea that many feathers were in a small little pillow. Um, But thankfully, so if you see something that looked like, did they kill any chickens in here? It was a pillow um, that that happened in here. 
I don't know if you've ever been in a situation when you can't stand the smell of something. I know some people have just this high tolerance for horrible odors. I have a very low um, tolerance because I can smell a lot of things. There's actually a faint smell that comes from time to time into my office and I can smell it and I think I'm the only person that can smell it because everybody else thinks I'm crazy. I may be crazy, but for different reasons. I know that the smell is there and then certain treatments are done and then it, it, it leaves. And smell has a powerful effect on our memories and the way that we're present here. I remember when my oldest sister was pregnant, I went up to New York with her first child. I went to New York to visit her and I walked into the house, she gave me a hug and she said, Junior, I need you to go take a shower and when you're done, um, please don't put on that cologne because it makes me want to barf. <clears throat> um, I can't even remember what it was. Um, a few days ago, um, <clears throat> we had one person from our staff, I don't see her in here, and she went to get an umbrella out of the usher's closet. And very quickly, she opened the door, they had this whiff just come at her, this stench. And she says, what is that smell? And then she flipped on a light as she was reaching for an umbrella and there was a man who had snuck in and was sleeping um, in the closet. So not only was she scared, but the smell was so bad. So this person comes back in and says to us, um, somebody's sleeping in our closet. So Teresa, our executive pastor, gets up and she's like, I'll take care of it. And I'm working and I'm like, I guess I should go with her. So I feel bad. So I, I go behind her. And as I walk out from the offices right back here behind us, um, she's just standing at the door talking to the man. As I turn that corner into that room, the smell was unbearable for me. I held my breath and I just kept walking. I kept walking. I, I walked into the space where Guillermo, one of our guys, is here cleaning up. He's vacuuming and he looks at me. And all of a sudden, I see his face, and I can tell that he smells what I smell, but he thinks it's me. <laughs> so very quickly, I want to make sure that he knows it's not me. I was like, that's not me. And he's like, mm, uh, you sure it's not you? I was like, it's a man taking a nap in the closet. I promise you. And I walked over the hand sanitizer, and then I took a big whiff, like my smelling sauce, and I went back to the closet to assist Teresa. But she took it like a boss. <laughs> if something doesn't smell good, there's a high, high probability that you won't even touch it, much less eat it. Like if you've ever walked into a house and they're doing, they're boiling, what is it, cabbage? Or they got broccoli or cauliflower or some of these, they, some of them taste great, some of you are like, oh, I'm so hungry right now. Like you just ate an hour ago, but the point is, there are things that just because of the way they smell, you won't even touch them. I remember I walked in from doing the lawn once and I was gonna give my son a hug, my oldest son, and I was drenched and I walked over and Tony backed up and he's like, you smell like a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> and, and then he just walked away, he didn't want the hug. See, our, our senses are a powerful thing. They're the primary, but not the only way in which we connect and interact with the world around us and process things. And societies have changed in the manner in which our senses are used. For instance, in the 19th century, many museum goers, goers uh, felt the need and felt very comfortable not only touching the different artifacts, but licking them because our tongue has such a way of connecting with things. Can you imagine going to the Museum of Fine Arts and doing that? Like, excuse me, sir, please don't lick the statue. See, Jesus meets us right where we are. And yet, he invites us into a new way of being present, a new way of imagining life. And Jesus uses the senses that he has given us to show us something more profound and something more lasting. In Mark chapter one that we just read describes the end or the beginning of this chapter, the end of this chapter, really the beginning of Jesus' ministry. 
But Mark chapter 1 describes the beginning of Jesus' ministry in dramatic fashion. It begins by saying, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the rescuer, the Son of God. And it kind of leaves us hanging there. And these words, the beginning, are echoing Genesis chapter 1. It connects the reader to the story of creation. In other words, Jesus is here doing something big. Jesus is doing something new. Mark utilizes the language that denotes urgency at many levels. Over and over, we come across, if you read carefully the book of Mark, you see this word immediately. In other versions, it may say at once. In a sense, Mark is a high action-packed letter. And given the fast pace of this letter, Mark mentions the baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit descending on him. He's being led into the wilderness for 40 days where he's tempted by Satan. And then Jesus emerges out of the wilderness with power and authority. He is preaching the word of God. He is healing people. People are being delivered and lives are being restored. Very quickly, he displays his authority over the human heart, over nature, over the supernatural, over sin, over illnesses, over diseases and afflictions. Jesus is making himself known as as well as his rule, this kingdom that is beginning to permeate every area of life. In verse 32 of chapter 1 says that that evening after sunset, the people brought Jesus, brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town, it wasn't like Jersey Village, I don't think they had 8,000 people in here. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. Imagine you're a town showing up at your door wanting something from you because only you can give it. This is what Jesus was experiencing. Notice that the text says that he healed many, not all. Now, I don't know why on this side of eternity, we all don't receive a cure for our sickness. I wish I had a real clear answer as to why that is. But I do know that ultimately we're made whole in Christ and in heaven. People who were bound to their mattresses are now walking. People who were blind can now see. The deaf were able to hear. The bound are free. The oppressed are now liberated. And the depressed are now lifted up. Their countenances change. Can you imagine the sheer joy, the celebration erupting in this little town, in the hearts of these people, in these families, because of what Jesus has done? The word kept getting out of what Jesus was doing. And more people kept coming to him. Lives were being changed because they had an encounter with Jesus Christ. I believe that it's very difficult, if not nearly impossible, to have an encounter with Jesus and remain the same. Mark chapter 1 continues. He, referring to Jesus, also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. See, things were happening in the physical realm, but also in the invisible spiritual realm. And Jesus doesn't make a distinction between the two realms. Jesus was in the process of revealing to humanity who he was. Demons knew who Jesus was and Jesus kept them from speaking up because as it says, the demons are not the ones that are going to introduce me into this world. There's no way. Jesus had a way of doing things and he lived it out. And what's interesting when you start reading really reading the story and pressing in is the people weren't really looking to Jesus because he was the Messiah, the Savior. They were going to Jesus because he had something for them. They only wanted Jesus, what he could do for them. And this comes up several times as Jesus is revealing himself to humanity, that people were only interested in the miracles and what they could get for Jesus. 
Unfortunately, I think sometimes we approach Jesus this way. We only want what he can give us or what we think he should give us. And yet Jesus in his mercy and his kindness and his love, he still freely gives. He gives of himself ultimately. He wants us to know him. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to be people who share his love with other people. He wants to transform our lives. He wants to make us more and more into his image, not just receive healing, not just receive freedom and unity and peace, but he says, I want you to really know me. I want to live in you. I want to direct your life in every area of your life. And God is willing and able and ready to do that in and through us. But something I notice as you read these stories, that these people are full of some kind of desperation. They're coming to Jesus from all corners of this little town, of this region of Galilee, coming to Jesus because he has something for them. And I wonder for us, are we desperate enough today to do whatever it takes to get before Jesus? Or are we just conformed to coming and maybe something will happen? And until then, I'll just continue to live life like I've always lived it. And I'll do my little pass by prayers with my fingers crossed hoping that something shows up. Or am I really that desperate to show up to Jesus? Desperation has a way of driving us sometimes to do what seems unreasonable or perhaps even risky. Desperation will lead us to finally cry out with our whole being. If and when you are desperate enough, you will cry out to Jesus. Some of us experience this kind of sacred desperation. It, it doesn't have to be till we hit rock bottom and kept digging. It doesn't have to be that kind of desperation. It's that acknowledgement that I can't do this without you, Lord. Until that day comes, you will continue to rely on your own strength and on your own way of doing things. Jesus continued to travel along this region of Galilee, moving around. He was preaching and casting out demons and healing people all along the way. Something interesting to note is that every time that the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed, very close behind is healings and the casting out of demons. Because when we truly proclaim the power and the word of Jesus Christ, signs and wonders follow. It paves the way for God to do what only God can do. And then scripture says, as we've read, and a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling and said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. This man with leprosy approached Jesus. This dude held the ultimate amount and kind of cooties that you can think about in all of this land. And remember when we were afraid of COVID, what we would do, we would go to great lengths. We would avoid people like the plague if they had even been exposed to someone who may have had it. I mean, we take baths in hand sanitizer, douse our faces with vodka or whiskey because it supposedly kept everything away, triple mask if necessary, Ziploc bags, whatever it took around places that we shouldn't have bags around, but we did it because we didn't want to contaminate ourselves with. The desperation within this man who approaches Jesus gave him incredible amount of courage. And that's one thing I've noticed about courage. It doesn't just always come easy, it tends to come in difficult situations. Almost by definition, is then when we need it. The law prohibited this man from being in contact with others, yet he approaches Jesus. Remember, the word says that he's being bombarded, swarmed by people, which means he had to get through other people to get to Jesus. But yet hope had taken root in this man's heart. And notice his body language. He is imploring Jesus. He is kneeling before Jesus, this sign of mercy. Lord, would you do something for me here and now? 
I think sometimes when we're invited to pray, we sit very stoic and respectful. I think sometimes this is what prayer looks like. We're imploring before God. We are kneeling before God. May our posture match the desperation within our souls. May that break out in us, in our church. Not to impress anyone else. This man didn't care about anyone else right now. But he knew that Jesus had something that only Jesus could do. He was begging Jesus, groveling. And I wonder, when was the last time you actually begged for something? I think sometimes in our pride, we don't beg for anything. We might pout about something, especially with your spouse if you want something from them, or your kids to try to make them feel bad and manipulate. That's not begging. When was the last time you saw a grown person actually beg for something? Leprosy would encapsulate a large number of skin diseases. In this case, when we read this in the original language, we understand, and other versions actually say it this way, that this man was covered in leprosy from head to toe. This is the phrase that Luke actually uses in his narrative. And when we think of leprosy, I think sometimes we think of an infection so bad that people's body parts simply start to rot off and ultimately fall off and create all sorts of deformities within a person. Studies show that the body's warning system of pain is destroyed, and the disease would numb their extremities as well as their ears, their eyes, and their nose, and devastation would end up coming, this commentator writes, because they would reach into the coal fire to retrieve a dropped potato and be unable to feel, or washing one's face with scalding water or gripping a tool so tightly that all of a sudden their hand is traumatized in this position, position and becomes stump-like. In third world countries, vermin sometimes chew on the sleeping lepers on parts of their body. Thus, Dr. Brand, after performing corrective surgery on a leper, would send a cat home with them as a normal post-operative procedure. And Dr. Brand calls this disease a painless hell. This poor man in our story, we don't know how long, but it's reasonable to believe that for years he was full, ridden with this disease all over his body, mutilated from head to toe, most likely missing pieces. The stench was repulsive, as was the sight. A leper in this kind of advanced condition was fully aware that there was very little anybody could do for him. And if he had the smallest amount of memory loss, everyone around him would remind him of his hideous and awful condition. In Leviticus chapter 13, it says in verse 45, anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, Let the hair be unkept, cover the lower part of their face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone, and they must live outside the camp. Due to the embarrassment, the humiliation, the isolation that these people would endure. If you had something of this nature, could you imagine going to H-E-B? Could you imagine going to the mall, to a little league game, with your hair all tattered, you look like a circus clown, you look like a homeless person with what you're wearing. You have to cover your face, we've all been there. But then on top of that, you have to announce it as if the visual isn't enough. Unclean, unclean, let the world know. You have to visibly, audibly announce your condition. The smell would take care of itself. Could you do it? He's like, no, I'll just stay in this cave and die. I don't know if I can do that. 
and yet people did it. I wondered if, if this man approached Jesus, if Jesus heard him yelling from a distance as he approached him, unclean, unclean coming through. If a leopard stuck his head into a house, the house was declared unclean. So there's what Leviticus, what's written in Leviticus, and then there's what the people added on because I guess God needed some clarity. It was illegal to greet a leper. Lepers had to remain 100 cubit feet away or 150 feet away, 100 cubits away if they were upwind, and four cubits, which is six feet, if downwind. I wonder where we got our six feet from. Under no circumstances are you allowed to touch a leper. Can't touch this. Can't touch this. This is (laughs) Let's have a time. Can't touch this. All right. This is what was playing Everywhere this guy walked around. This is his walkout song. The historians, Josephus, reports that lepers treated, were treated in their day as dead men. This man knew what was at stake. And yet despise, despite the curse that seemed to riddle his life, he cried out to Jesus. In other words, you did it. You've done it for so many people. Maybe, maybe, Jesus, you will do it for me. Why not? He knew that Jesus had the ability to heal, but he wasn't sure if Jesus actually would heal. He says, moved with pity, referring to Jesus, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean." I I think those words, I will, extremely powerful words for us. Because it wasn't anything special in of the leper himself or anyone else. Is I will. All dependent on God. This word pity gives us insight into the heart of God. He was moved with compassion. It was more than just simply feeling sorry for this guy. It's, it's, It's a feeling that led him to compassion propelled him to some kind of action at the core of his being. Another translation actually says that Jesus was angered. It's like a righteous indignation toward all the evil and everything that sin had caused here in this world. See, Jesus bucked the boundaries of his day in order to reveal himself, his power, his love, his healing. Jesus did the unthinkable. He had a conversation with the man which the law prohibited him to talk to. He was at close range in proximity to this person. Not only did he just begin to have a contact with him, but now he began to listen to him, to hear his plight. And then Jesus touched the untouchable. Jesus touched this guy's grody, all dried up, highly infected wounds. And this man kneeling before Jesus, Jesus reaches down. This image of God, the Father, even from heaven, stepping down and touching us in our, in our muck, in our mess. It wasn't just a little boop, dinky little touch. It was a firm, deliberate touch. I wonder how long this man had gone without any affection. Whatsoever. That touch represented so many things acceptance and love and grace, forgiveness of sins, and healing. We get this beautiful image of this desperate leper laying down at Jesus' feet, bending down and kneeling before Jesus and Jesus touching him. See, the intentionality of Jesus' touch is tangible in more ways ways that I think we can define here this morning. Notice Jesus' power and authority over disease. In many ways, that power and authority has been also given to us, not only to share the good news of Jesus Christ, as we're told in Matthew 28, but to pray for the sick, 
for the blind, for the lame, for the lepers, for those that are outside of our camp. Verse 42, and immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Immediately, again, that word that Mark loves to use appears and on the spot leprosy left him. Vast implications for this. The curse had been lifted. No longer was he around just yelling. Can't touch this. Unclean, unclean coming through. He didn't have to yell this anymore. Isolation, just like that, vanished. Free to now re-engage community, to be reunited back to his family, to actually get a job, to contribute to life in a different way. All because Jesus reached out and touched him. Who knows how long he'd been this way? Who knows how far he traveled to make his way to Jesus? Imagine what this man is experiencing right now. He's beginning to say immediately it left him. He still, by law, had to go to the priest to be deemed unclean. At this point, it's a formality because you could see it. And we could stop here and say, man, that's a really cool story. But I think there's more to the story. There's a story that we read at face value, and then there are the undertoes of the story and the implications of what Jesus was trying to communicate to the people of his day. There are the undertones of the story that begin to shape and form our souls. See, God has a habit of taking the visible to teach us an invisible truth. And he starts with our empirical senses that invites us to think differently and deeper about life, about God, about ourselves, about this world. Many times the stories of Jesus healing the blind, the crippled, and the leper, and the unclean were all pointing to humanity's spiritual condition. Jesus crossed and broke just about every ceremonial law and cultural norm to bring healing and freedom to all of humanity. Ultimately, he defeated death and conquered sin and everything else that was caused and affected by sin so that you and I could be in full relationship with God. See, spiritually, I was the guy sleeping in that closet for many years. I couldn't stand my own stench. I was riddled with guilt and shame, and I would yell, unclean, unclean, even though Jesus had showed up for me. And I was stuck there. See, it's so easy and comfortable in our lives with everything that we have and all the blessings that have been poured onto us to think that everyone else is the one who is unclean and yet not me. But it's at that point when you realize that you are the unclean one, that there is no remedy for what you have, that desperation begins to sink in. It's that place where you actually begin to cry out to God. When you begin to implore and truly kneel. Some of us have coasted really well and have masked our desperation, but maybe it's time for us to say to God right now, I implore you, I beg you, would you show up here in this situation, in this church, in this family? Because, Lord, we need you. I can't do this on my own. And I'm tired of convincing everybody else that I don't stink. It takes a lot of work to do that. But Jesus was using a lot of these healings you read in Scripture as a mirror to our souls. I came to the realization I couldn't clean myself. And then God said, good, I've been waiting. Would you let me? And God began to do what only he could do. See, only the sick need a healer. And I believe only the desperate will see a miracle. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your power. Lord, it's so easy to get caught up 
in the perfunctory of life. And to think that it's everybody else has the issues and not us. But Lord, would you move in us? And as we pray, I wonder, are you desperate enough for God to do something for you? If so, would you ask him? Would you be bold? Whatever it is, you don't have to tell me. You don't even have to come up front. I'm going to have you raise your hand today at all, but just say, Lord, here's my situation. I don't know what he's going to do, but be prepared for him to transform you. If you've known that he's touched you, he's cleansed you, thank him for it. And be prepared, because now he's going to use you to touch the untouchable. So we were the untouchables. We were uncleaned. But yet, Lord, you, you have made yourself known, your power. I ask in the name of Jesus for you to give us courage. Use this desperation in us. Make us desperate for you, for your power, for your leading, for more of your spirit in our lives. So that we too can go to those places outside of the camp to those that need you individually and as at a church. We thank you, Lord, for your presence, for your power, for your touch. In your name we pray and ask all of this. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing. Amen. The Lord has been with us this morning. The Lord be with us as we leave this place. May those spaces of desperation 
grow ever more in us that leads us to a dependence upon God. And as we cry out to him, my prayer is that we will hear him say, I will. I don't know what that looks like for all of us, but that we would cry out to him in boldness and may our faith be bolstered as a result. So let us go in his peace, knowing that our Savior has reached out and touched us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.